Welcome back, everyone, to a new episode of the Four Seasons of Film podcast hosted by Nathan Robert Blackburn and myself, Andrew Pesha. We're picking up where we left off. It's part two of our Martin Scorsese uh, filmography review. We're starting at 1988's Last Temptation of Christ, all the way up to the newest movie, Killers of the Flower Moon. Enjoy. We left off right before Last Temptation of Christ. I've been excited. We're going to start with that? Yeah. That's, Jesus. Because the, the color of money was the last... Uh, what we stopped. Oh, on. oh my! I mean, who, who? I mean, we could start with who's that? You already talked about who's that knocking on the door, but I, I, I finally saw. I don't it. think I had talked about it though. Yeah, that's right. You skipped over it because okay. I didn't see it at the time. <laughs> well, then, Mister uh, Genius, why don't we talk about who's that knocking at my door? Nineteen sixty-seven. This was uh, Scorsese's first film. Um, <laughs> as I'm told, I finally just saw it uh, recently since the since the last episode. It stars uh, Harvey Keitel, and um, oh, what's the main actress? It's, it's uh, zit. It starts with a Z, right? I'm sure that helps. Yeah, she was in the Planets of the Apes show. Um, is there is there Planets of the Apes? Planet of the Apes. Yeah, there's no help. Just... There's Planets of the Apes. <laughs> maybe maybe the new one that they make. Um, Zena Bethune. Zena Bethune, yeah. Same last name as the character from Angus. That wonderful film from the 90s starring uh, James Vanderbeek. Oh, God. I for, we, how, weren't we supposed to watch that recently? Moving on. Talking about Mr. Uh, Scorsese. Yeah, the, the man. The Scorsese, myth. part two. <laughs> I it's fun. It was fun watching this, and I, I I wanted to apologize for not having to seen it before. Uh, watching it before when we were doing the Scorsese podcast because it was really cool to see how like since it's his first film, like you could see Scorsese there. <laughs> I it, think I I shovel fed you the same bullshit you're about to shovel feed me now. <laughs> it's like you listened. <laughs> You listened to the fucking first episode, no, and now true. I'm, I'm true, just going to get back everything that I said on the first episode and of it, this. And, and it's a fun, it's fun, it was, because it's about um, Harvey Keitel. You're loud. Is, you know, growing up as a young adult in New York, a man, I guess. Um, and, you know. Not that you would know. <laughs> and he's a, you know, he uh, meets this girl at the, at the, what, the Staten Island Ferry, or one of the ferries. Um, Backstory th- here is um, we did part one of a Scorsese retrospective, and Andrew decided not to watch <laughs> like I'm in trouble, Andrew. the very first film that Martin Scorsese ever directed. I thought we were starting up. I was, it was my mistake. I apologize. Real film. I would say not short film, not um, student film. It was the first, his first feature, what many, including myself, continue to call his first feature. Uh, who's that knocking at my door? Yeah. And he finally did watch it, even though we had to postpone this podcast twice because you still hadn't watched it because you didn't once, think it was important. Just once. Twice. Um, very, very much twice. <laughs> but I've seen it now. Okay. So what were your impressions of this uh, experimental early Scorsese movie? My f- Not just the plot. Not just the, well, I, I I like the the theme of it. What is it about? It's about his, it's about his buddies running around New York City. Yeah. He, he, causing havoc. Right, there. It's kind of like a not a gang, but you know, like, Catholic influence. Right, yeah, heavily Catholic influence. You want me to do the whole interview? And uh, he meets uh, uh, this uh, <laughs> this girl on the Staten Island Ferry. The, the actress, the hitting, actress from Planets of the Apes. Planets of the Apes, and they and they start hitting it off, and you know, yeah. So he's you know he's he's maybe mixed up with the wrong type of uh, type of crowd a little bit. You know, they like to who's he? Uh, Harvey Keitel. He they like to you know cause cause mischief and so he has to decide between that his, his life with them and this life with the girl but he has you know he's, he's not like a clean cut guy and but he's like well i want to you know i want to wait till uh till marriage with you to to have you know to have coitus and uh <laughs> <laughs> and uh and so it's like it's always, none it's always funny because like the movie he's like he you know you see him uh, begging hooahs and uh and what was the make on those people <laughs> I wanted to be like a, uh, the you know some Donald Trump. <laughs> what is that? I was trying, I was I was trying to do my Polly Walnuts. The who was? Ah, um, and uh, but he's like he, he's holding her up on this pedestal because he actually has feelings. Of like he, he's like ah no I don't want to do it. You know I said no. Uh, the plot is not necessary. Okay, you keep you just went into the plot. Well, it was the theme. It's a, the theme. You, you could just sum up this movie 
Scorsese's first feature, a bunch of young punks run around New York City in the 60s, wreaking havoc, fucking off, and one of them meets a girl who doesn't want to have sex before marriage. Yes. Okay. In a nutshell. Anything else going on in this movie? That's pretty much it. Okay, but I'm going to ask you about the style then, because the only... It's, it's a pivotal Scorsese movie because it's where it all began in features. And you can see an editing style. You can also see a, I'm going to say his name again, even though you said you didn't know who this was last time, a John Cassavetes influence that Scorsese eventually dropped and then developed his own mm. style. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's like a lot of, uh, I would say 99% of artists, you start out imitating the people that you like, and then if you stick with it long enough, you develop your own style. Yeah, for sure. Unless you keep ripping them off, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a which I will, I will not mention names in any industry, but there are those people that keep ripping people off and not doing their own voice, and we call these people successful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame, huh? Yeah, but uh, it is, it's, it's not my favorite Scorsese movie. I don't think it's anybody's favorite, but you cannot deny its power and its impact because it's the first one. And for anyone, this, if you turned in this film, holy shit, you'd go, this person is born to make more of these. For sure, yeah. And I, I don't know if this is a cat, like, because I noted, like, the bigger thing for me is, like, the style of, like, the editing when it's kind of, like, panning and then it does, like, the freeze frame, which he kind of, you Please know, don't describe editing techniques. It just, my stomach doesn't have the strength. As being an expert editor, having edited Never. And like crosses off here. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> keep it, keep it, keep it. I can say, it's just the movement of the camera and how the how the scenes progressed. I was just like, oh wow. It's just like you just it was the blueprint. Yeah, it's called directing. Yeah, yeah. I, f I feel like I feel like it was a it was a master class. Yeah, why why was I so upset that you hadn't seen this and now that you've watched it, do you wish you had? Please answer the first part first and the second part second. Okay. Uh why were you mad I didn't see this? Yes. Uh, because it's his first film. That's all I can think about. It's where it all started. That's all you can think of now. Yeah. That's all I can think of while you were mad. It was, yeah. it was the first one. I get a big deal. It was just the first one. <laughs> if we're doing the anthology or the, the whole the whole span of work. It was the world's introduction to Martin Scorsese as a feature film director and also his introduction to the city of New York in a lot of ways. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. He had to helm a big project, the biggest uh, he, he'd ever had to helm. And he did this, and he famously went through uh, a big delay. I, I want to say even a year delay because they had to add nudity scenes in it because the distributor wasn't happy because they were taking it overseas first to sell it because it wasn't selling in America or they didn't want to sell in America. I can't remember. But they famously, this thing has been, it had been shot and edited in a longer time than usual and not just within a couple months it was months later yeah. when they finally had to finish this film okay and when i watch it i can see the obvious i, I say like um it's like chop marks or like if you see a, a beautiful mercedes and there's a lot of people have come along and keyed it it's kind of that i can i look at i look at the his first film as oh my god this is a masterpiece but it's pretty rough Definitely. I mean, like anybody's first, first painting yeah. or first or first feature. I mean, I certainly don't think that about my first feature. Yeah, of course. Even though I totally do. And yeah. there's more metaphors in the dialogue in my first feature <laughs> than I think in every film that ever existed in the 1940s and 50s film noir. It holds a record for sure. Um, and it's it's cringeworthy. There's so many things that are cringeworthy in my first feature. Scenes go on way too long. Casting choices were wrong. Pe characters disappear for no reason and never come back. Oh, that's that's independent <laughs> filmmaking because those people just don't show up or they something. They were fired. Happened. Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> in one case, yes. Oh, God. But, I mean, you look back and certainly you can see my talent for something. I don't know what the fuck the talent was. But uh, we got it done. And that, yeah. I think that's the, that's the biggest thing about anybody's first feature. Um, and a master like Maestro Scorsese is, not only did he get it done, but he got it done with with enough style and panache to make his second film. Yeah. Boxcar Bertha. <laughs> we already covered that I one, know. jackass. Now, now we're going to jump into the future. I, I'm still not uh, even convinced why you watched Who's That Knocking, but I'm glad you did. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm glad I saw it too, now being a Scorsese expert. You've seen everything by Scorsese? Not yet. Um, I don't th think that qualifies you as an but expert. This, but this next, this next section, I've, I think I've seen every one of them but one. 
this next section? Yeah, part two. Okay, so what year are we starting with here? Uh, part one was his early career until The Color of Money. Right, that was 1987? 1987, so we're going from The Last Temptation of Christ, which was 88, 89? I have to look it up. I think, I'm sure. <laughs> I, can't, I can't look up stuff. My remember? mother can look things up. You know, I, you, I can look it up. No, you don't have to look it up. And by the way, you're not supposed to have phones. Well, that's what I was bye saying. Bye-bye. 88. Bye-bye, give me that. Let's go. No, no, no. Surrender it over here. You're not uh, getting it back. I'm not touching it. It's, it's in my pouch. You're going to get it at the back of the school term. All right. Um, yeah, 1988 for The Last Temptation of Christ. 88. Um, so this is off of his commercial success with The Color of Money. And Scorsese says he chooses to do uh, his passion project and a film that every studio <laughs> went, why would you do this to us? <laughs> I, I, can, I can imagine. Why would you make this your next film? Oh, my God. Uh, the life of Jesus Christ, his journey through life as he faces the struggles all humans do, and his final temptation on the cross. That just bleeds money to me. Oh, yeah. I just want, I want to sign up. You know, <laughs> you're not supposed to talk about religion or politics at the dinner table, and Scorsese serves Let's it up. Let's do a three-hour movie about it. Silver platter with Barbara Hershey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, that was a, it. Was my first time watching it, but this is one of my favorite Scorsese films of all time. I've seen it countless amounts of times. I watched this movie for the first time when I was in high school, and I loved it then. And everyone knows what they were like in high school the the lack of ambition and want of knowledge and the lack of uh, attention span alone proves that this movie transcends ignorance. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and some I, would say for different reasons. But I'm saying because I was an asshole teenager and I loved this, you know how good this fucking movie oh, is. Oh, man. I, 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 am, I regret not having seen this a long time ago. You could say that about any movie with yeah, you. Yeah, not every... No, not every movie. But this one... Any. This, I didn't say every. I said any movie. You have, your, your movie regret list is like people <laughs> people that they've slept with that they didn't want to because they're, they're disgusting. <laughs> well, but this, I think this one's... Uh, yeah, on the list because of the the question reverse Don Juan uh, of, of of religion. No wonder the lady is Don Juan. Anything to do with you? <laughs> yeah, but I yeah man, I've been I've been wanting to talk about this one because it was a hell of a first time watching it. Holy well, you shit. grew up Catholic, so yes, you're supposed to hate this movie. I, I guess no, you're so. not. No, he's Catholic. Scorsese is yeah, famously Catholic. Catholic. Yeah. So making this movie, it was kind of like I said. Passion Project, very controversial movie. Controversial in what way do you think? Did you do any research about this movie? I didn't do any research. I can I can take some guesses. Okay, let's hear those. Uh, because the, the the portrayal of Jesus not being the actually portraying him as a real human being because instead of a deity. Well, right? especially because he's the guy that stapled his nuts to the floor in later films. <laughs> Yeah, man. and Willem Dafoe. <laughs> I mean, well, you got staple. I'm not going to help people. Willem Dafoe did that in a film called Antichrist, directed yeah. by Lars Van Trier. That's I cannot unsee that scene, oh, even if, if even if he's playing Jesus. I still think that's that's one of those heinous things I've ever seen on film. Burnt into my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but he got he got he got staple. My mind is in staple to the floor. Like that's the thing. It's like he's portrayed as you know a, a person who a human a, mom, a human sin, doubt. You know he's doubt. It, you know, he's trying to figure out he's trying to figure out if he's quote unquote Jesus, you know, himself. And that probably I you know, I can't speak for anybody. That that probably goes against the entire conceit of Jesus is that he had doubt that he was Jesus. Yeah, because all the stories are like, I I turn this in, uh, water into wine, I am all knowing, I I heal, I do all this. You know, like it's not the I don't know if I am this person. I it like to hear the Catholic blow up points from a Catholic because is that really that's what you guys go <laughs> Yeah, I, well, yeah, because I do this and I do this and I do this. Yeah, it's, it's just, you know, I was raised Presbyterian. We definitely didn't talk about Jesus that way. And, and you know, and then you got Mary. It's like, her. hey, be kind, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can see, I can see why this is very controversial because it's not like this pure, pure spirit. I guess. What are you uh, talking about? He's totally. It is. Well, a, he, he he's is the pure. best. I think. I actually disagree with. If 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 you think there's detractors on the portrayal of the of the character of Jesus Christ in this movie, I actually think this this I represents think negative. This represents the most pure version of Jesus because it feels like the most human version or the most likely version of if he in fact was human. Well, pure in the sense that of of a god, pure god. I didn't think of person. him as a deity at all in this. 
No, not at all. That and that's why I loved it because it was just like, hey, <laughs> kind of like, hey. Um, I always get the this come, one come can, follow me. Come follow me. I, I'm saying some, some some good stuff, and that's I, how it started. I always confuse this one with the the devil character from this one with the devil character in the Passion of the Christ. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the devil the devil in this is kind of like a worm kind of looking guy, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And, and then in like the Passion of the Christ is like a little kid. Oh yeah, that's right. I, Creepy little yeah. devil kid. And um, yeah, so this one more look, the, the devil in this looks like a Star Wars character, <laughs> and so, but he's still very creepy. Right? Yeah, I, he's like Jabba the Hutt's assistant. Remember that guy? <laughs> oh, the little yeah, the little, yeah. little squawky thing. But the thing about this movie, besides the controversy over the deity, you know, portrayal of, of, of Jesus, for me, my favorite part is the landscapes and the visuals yeah. of this movie. They they feel like the paintings of a of of da vinci they feel they feel like the renaissance version of the bible i mean it it almost feels like this movie's ordained yeah to me and people were like oh my god that's sacrilegious this movie was not ordained it's the entire opposite of that and to me maybe that's why people freaked out about this movie so much because it felt like maybe a true believer catholic made what was in his head yeah this on is, screen right this is this is how i picture the story of Jesus. This is how I picture the times in in Jerusalem during during that. You know, and that's how years. I pictured it. And I think a lot of a lot of people pictured the story of the Bible and Jesus in this way. And I think it's one of. I mean, it is as close as a representation a representation of the Bible or Jesus's life that I can think of yeah. in in historical film content context for sure. Yeah, I, I I'm trying to think because like because like growing up and like you know going to Catholic school, going to all this, just being burnt, you know, burnt, burnt, uh, being you know just Jesus, how harsh over, were they? Over and over again, I was fine. I never got hit. I never got burned. You're saying burned? Yeah, well, Freudian slip. Well, no, it's like you're going to hell. Everything. If you're Catholic, if you do anything, you're going to hell. Um, oh, so sounds fun. Yeah, it's great. And so that's why it's like like this. And then then um. Uh, what, what, what a passion of the Christ? Yeah, I watched that. But other than that, I don't really watch religious movies just from the fact of, you know, like growing up in it. But seeing it and how how being in that environment and growing up in it, and then seeing something like this, it was like it's great to to just kind of qu not question. I don't know if that's the right word, but just to see another perspective and it's just like it was just expansive for me watching it i was just like man my mind is blown that's why i was like i wish i would watch this when i was younger just for the reason of coming out of that you know the catholic religion huh. i really can't speak to that because i wasn't raised that way but um my mind wasn't blown because of the representation uh was different than i thought my mind was blown because i went oh that's what I figured. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> that's how I yeah, figured it how, went. That's how I figured it went down. Yeah, me too. That's how, that, it was. I, shit, man, it's just real people just living and during that time. Trying Although to Harvey Harvey Keitel's uh, Brooklyn accent, you know, I don't know. Hey, Judas was from Brooklyn. I don't know, man. That's the only the street. Only thing like I I love Keitel to death, but in this movie, I kept going. It, it doesn't really sound like the way I thought that Judas would sound like. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it to him. It's Keitel. Um, and Willem Dafoe, you can't say oh, more. Man, I mean, that's just, just, that's the performance of his, of his entire career, I think. Such a gem of an actor. Such a gem. <laughs> Everything he does. He was fucking agent. I, 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 I will be. Willem. <laughs> we should put you two together. The cross and Jesus. That's, uh, that, that's all you. <laughs> Match made in You're heaven. such a gem, Willem. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm glad a, it blew your mind. If you haven't seen it, just, you know. If you're religious, see it. It's, it might make you angry. If you're religious, see it. You actually might enjoy it because, you know. I think you. I think you should enjoy it because, in my mind, yeah, that's the closest representation you're going to get to yeah. real life. Yeah, you did. It's not derogatory. And I'm not saying what happens at at, not happens at the end either. You know, with uh, the question of Mary Magdalene being his wife, did they sleep together? Yeah, you know, that, did that have, whole crazy. But that was like, is that just the delusions of him dying? Yeah, I, I think he buttoned it up pretty well. But you got to remember, this movie came out in the late '80s, so right, yeah, you but know, not a lot sacrilegious. of not a lot of people you know buttoned things up this way. So it, I can understand the controversy. But in hindsight, if you put a movie out like this today, I don't think there would be nearly as much controversy. Oh, for sure. I mean, they famously, you know, protested dogma, Kevin Smith's dogma. They're the, the fuck fucking rubber poop monster in that movie. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, you never know what anybody's going to be angry about. You never know. Uh, what's next on the old Scorsese list? What is next? Goodfellas? <laughs> I don't know that there's any more to say 
about Goodfellas. Perfect. Perfect movie. I mean... I love it. I, can, I can't get enough. I could watch that movie any fucking time. This is what I'm talking about. You say this same shit when, even if the microphone's not on. About Goodfellas? Yes, it's boring. Yeah. The movie's so great, you bore me with the way you talk about it. It's, I, it's, I, can't, I can't apologize. It's boring. <laughs> no, it's not boring. You're boring. This is, I mean, come on. This is like... I mean, now we're seeing Temptation of the Last Temptation of Christ. That's Scorsese's movie. But this is like when you, when you think of Scorsese, this is the movie that comes to people's minds. I mean, technically, we're supposed to talk about New York stories first, but it was a segment he directed. It was a it was a, like a chronology movie. But uh, I don't consider it that way because Goodfellas is next. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, yeah, he directed exactly. the whole thing. Right. Uh, what can you say about Goodfellas besides it is a perfect movie? It deserves to be in the Smithsonian. Um, there was a famous detractor talking about how it, she hated the movie because it was a, it's a misogynistic movie about a boys club and about a bunch of people that murder people and it hates women. Um, I would argue that Lorraine, uh, Bracco's character in this movie is a pretty big pivotal role for women. Yeah. She, she's I mean, like, she stands up to that motherfucker. Yeah. She, she she doesn't start, doesn't take as much shit as you think she's gonna take. She fucking stands up first. She puts a goddamn uh, gun in his face in bed and says, "I'm gonna blow your fucking brains out." Yeah. Um. But I can I can I can get the argument why maybe ladies don't like this movie so much because it is violent. It is mis you know I can see misogynist tendencies in it, but that's the world. Right. That's the world that the the novel is in. That's the world that these these guys grew up in. Um, the celebrate the celebration of it is always the sticky slope with me with the mafia or with anybody who uh, any organization or, or or people that act immorally at times. It, why is it cool that these people right. get away with murder and and theft and all this kind of thing? There is that social thing where you like to shirk society and say fuck the government and fuck the man, right? You know, that's, and, that's the only that's why you're on their side is because it's like they're they're sticking it. Sticking but they it. kill a lot of people. I mean, yeah. murder a lot of people. So I mean, without going into it in any more depth, because I do I do love Goodfellas and it is a perfect movie. But, you know, without going into it too deeply, why do they all get a pass? Uh, it's just, I don't know. It's just it's it's like the watching that we watched the Sopranos recently. It's like they're not good people, but you just can't look away because you want to see what happens next. It's well, you like, forget about it for some reason. Yeah, it's like it's oh, OK, you just got plugged. OK, cool. Uh, moving on, moving on. Let's see where they're going to go rob the, the rob the truck now. You know, I think it's because. It's it's well, I I think I've said this before on a, on a different podcast is because it's because it's a glimpse into that world that underbelly that's sitting right there in front of you you know it's like that's why it's like hey you know his next door neighbors they know he's in the mafia but he's still you know Henry Hill is like hey I'm still gonna yeah I still have a, I'm the neighbor to John and that whole world is right next to you at any moment I don't know I don't think they get a pass just because they live next door no they don't get a pass it's just they're. they're people that do horrible things but i guess it's just that they're people i think secretly everyone wants to be rich i think everyone doesn't want a job right. i think if anybody approached you to do this kind of work you go oh, I, I, all right i'll do it but i'm not killing anybody and then when you get into it too much you go well you got to kill this one guy you go all right just one yeah and that's i think i think there's a glitz and a glamour to it when it comes to the financial aspects to the mafia in movies and also the power that it that it uh wields and uh and I, th I think it's it's sexy in that way, but the reality is kind of like the '60s and the hippies in San Francisco. It was dirty. There was a lot of chlamydia, <laughs> <laughs> and you know it wasn't it wasn't the uh, yeah free love was all great, but that it, it came at a price. Meaning, um, don't yeah plug up your nostrils. Right. Yeah. And then this world is just dog eat dog. Everyone's dying. You don't know when you're gonna get clipped. It's a lot more glamorous when you don't see the the, the autopsy photos of right. all these people, or the crime scene photos, I should say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Goodfellas, fuck you. No. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's the it's great. What can you say? We fuck. I, I'm not even gonna elaborate. Let's just move on. Yeah, it's Goodfellas. I, we had to say something negative about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, <laughs> That's the only way to go. You can. You, I mean, you, you seriously gonna say everything anybody else has said about Goodfellas? Right. Yeah. Ugh, God. All right, 1990, Goodfellas. We're into the 90s, the 90s, and we are also into successful Scorsese movies, 
And this follow-up to Goodfellas was 1991's Cape Fear. Cape Fear. A remake. Did you know that, Andy? I didn't know it was a remake. No. You... <laughs> I didn't know. <sighs> okay. No, I do. Original was made in 62. Okay. By who? Gregory Peck. Ooh. And uh, one of my favorite actors of all time, Robert Mitchum. Oh, Robert Mitchum, yeah. Uh, Jay Lee Thompson, direct. You wouldn't even know any of this. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I agree. <laughs> um, but is a remake of of the '62 version, starring Mr. Robert De Niro again, mm. and uh, Nick Nolte. Yeah. Who is absolutely? Uh, you've seen this, right? Oh yeah, a, a lot of times. Uh, a few times, not not uh, enough. I don't enough. know why I've seen I've seen this one a lot, yeah. and I don't know what that says about my upbringing. But it seems like I watched this a lot in the 90s. Were you scared of getting kidnapped? Somebody coming out underneath the car? I don't know. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> That's still one of the creepiest fucking shots ever, man. I think the, the, the scene where he's smoking the cigar and laughing in the movie theater is the creepiest scene in the that movie. That is creepy. De Niro is just the epitome of creepy in this movie. I think it his might be one of his best roles ever because of how scary he is. Oh, yeah. Just unrelenting. I mean, he is so scary in this because he's overtly physically intimidating yeah and it's not like a subdued version where he's playing a mafia guy this is oh my god this guy could tear my face off yeah at and any don't, turn in this movie don't say the one wrong word one wrong word to him he's gonna fucking explode and it's a little over the top which i do like about it i like the movie as a whole because it's kind of like a throwback to 50s movies in a way where yeah. we we go a little bit big but for good reasons and you and how does he pull it off? I don't know. I think it might be the acting and the way it's shot. But he can go Gregory Peck with with Nick with the Nick Nolte character. And he can go even bigger than Robert Mitchum went with his character in Robert De Niro's character. And we're still getting to the end. The, the ending is the only part that is a little bit too much for me, where he gets thrown off the boat and yeah. then he find he somehow finds the line <laughs> yeah. and he grabs it and he cl and he, he climbs back yeah. on board. That's bullshit. Yeah, that, that's such bullshit. But whatever. I Even as it. a kid, I went that didn't happen. That couldn't happen. Yeah. The rapids. It had to. It had to have happened. It had to have that one last hurrah. And I don't remember the Cape Fear River being this strong and with that many rapids. Yeah, I, I could be wrong. I don't. I don't know. We. I mean, we used to live on the East Coast near the Cape Fear River. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that no, that Something was that, near Wilmington. That's not. That's not fucking. I don't know. It could be in I'm some just, areas, but maybe, I. You know. I thought it, it looked like a soundstage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I did, and Juliet Lewis is so oh, yeah. innocent and, and wonderful in this movie. She makes a hell of an acting turn in this, and she was young too. Yeah, and that was the, the, the creep. Yeah, that was creepy on De Niro with like the whole story between the, him uh, oogling after. I mean, she wasn't even twenty. So no, wow. I mean, she yeah, she had to be sixteen, seventeen years old when she did this. Yeah. I mean, every every bit of this movie. You never seen Body Heat, have you? Uh, no, I haven't. There's no. a certain amount of feeling that some directors can evoke, and it's I can only describe it as but like like body heat and like Cape Fear, the setting you can feel the sweat mm. on the actors and on the people on screen. You can feel how hot it is. You can feel the climate in in their movies because of how good a director that, that some of these people are. Um, and Cape Fear is like that. You feel like you're sweating every, in every scene in this movie because nobody uses air conditioning. <laughs> and it's human as shit. And that's what I think about as an adult now. <laughs> is there air conditioning? I don't want to be in this movie. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but Cape Fear, I think it, I, it, it's one of my favorite Scorsese movies because it is just, it's sometimes he just, he does a movie and it's like, you know, this one is going to be big and, and try to be successful and I'm still going to make it and kick you in the ass. Yeah. And it's just, edge of your seat the whole time he can time. do anything is the point he can direct any movie any genre big small documentary and he's gonna knock it out of the fucking park yeah so why even continue with any other movie because you know everyone that's gonna happen now is gonna be our favorite <laughs> it just keeps getting better the stakes keep getting higher <sighs> so if you had to guess what was next after cape fear what would you guess is it kundun not even fucking close oh, okay then i don't know uh, Come on, put it together. Uh, Cape Fear. Is it Heat? He did not direct Heat. That was Michael Mann. Oh, that's right. You yeah. fucking degenerate. My bad. <laughs> My bad. Oh, he had a great movie. You. Uh, uh, well, we're not even going to talk about this one because you haven't seen it. Because I wish I had the quote that you said when I asked you 
if you had seen this movie. And it was very much like a lot of people I went to film school with and a lot of people that have Goodfellas and Casino posters on their college dorm walls. I say, have you ever seen The Age of Innocence? And I haven't. Uh Uh-huh. Do you remember what you said, though? I do not. What did I say? I'm sure it was great. I'm I'm going to paraphrase because it's it's too much for me to even remember. I blocked the memory out. (laughs) But you... You said something along the lines of that's the least Scorsese movie on my list that I need to watch. I mean, a period piece? Come on. <laughs> that's essentially what you said. It's starring Daniel Day Lewis, and any performance by Daniel Day Lewis on screen, you you should be ashamed of yourself to not clamor to see. Yeah, I, including I this one. It is It's one of his finest performances. It is a period piece directed by Martin Scorsese. This is like saying, I never want to see Barry Lyndon. uh, I I understand. I understand. I know. I can't. I love it when your true self comes out and you don't even know it. (laughs) Your true self, you go, are you fucking kidding? I take my Scorsese cold. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. (laughs) I mean, who the fuck has the snobbery to say a sentence like that? I know, that? I know. I'm, a, I'm an asshole sometimes. I mean, would you ever say that to him? No. Fuck no. Of course you wouldn't. But I say it in confidence because we've known each other long enough. And you know I have a podcast. Um, <laughs> 1993's The Age of Innocence Take is one of the best visual Martin Scorsese movies of all time. Of all time. There is no way to get around it. It's one of the most romantic... I think it might be the most romantic Scorsese movie. And just the fact that it does exist, that he did not need to turn a Edith Wharton novel into a movie, he didn't need this. He did it because these movies, they probably won't make money, but he wanted to do it. He did do it, and he turned in a fucking masterpiece. It's on Criterion Collection. I've probably seen it 10 times. I can't get enough of it. I study it. My God, what is wrong with you? I'm going to watch it. <laughs> yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. I just changed your mind. I love it. Yeah. I, I, I would, I'm going to say it's going to take 40 years before you see it. Yeah. <laughs> no. 40 years it at won't least. Be that long. But. I could bring it up every day, every week for you to watch it. And you, <laughs> you seriously well, was, would never watch The Age of Innocence, even though it is a Scorsese picture. I, I will watch it. It won't take 40 years, maybe just 20. 20 I'm kidding. I'm going to watch years. it within the next year. Uh, no, you won't. But anyway, we're going to move on to the next film. And uh, like Goodfellows, what can you really say about 1995's Casino? Oh, God. That's, that's Growing up, that was my Scorsese movie. I watched the shit. I've probably seen Casino at least 25 I know. You're one, of these, you're one of these weird people that think Casino is better than Goodfellas. I it, I just like it better. I gr- cause that it, doesn't make any sense. You always say that and you never back it up. Well, it's because... <laughs> Growing up, it's the one you saw the most. Not only, not only being Catholic, I spent a lot of time at casinos growing up. I like, I like boobs. I'm not a butt guy because I saw more boobs growing up. (laughs) What are you talking about? And that that was the one. It was the, it was the one that was more. It it was fresher when I finally was starting to really watch movies and, and I just, just being enthralled with it. Just and you got De Niro and Pesci. That fucking combination. You had De Niro and Pesci and Goodfellas. You did, yeah, and but I did, I saw Casino first. I didn't see Goodfellas till much later. Again, that's not what makes it a better movie. The order to which you saw it, I t- and then kind of just like how like the story of how like old Vegas became old Ve- or, you know, like or Vegas became Vegas at, before. Now you're just rehashing the plot, right? But just that to see the glimpse, like going growing up, going to Atlantic City, it's like oh, this is what this, all these casinos are. This was set in Las Vegas, not I Atlantic know, City. but it's still fucking the same shit. It's still casinos, it's not the same shit. It, it's it's still. Well, the people from the east went out west to go set it up. So it's like, hey, I like my Pesci and Goodfellas. I like my good. I like my Robert De Niro and Goodfellas. Um, I think they're. I think they almost could exist in the same world as Goodfellas. It almost seems like not a sequel to it, but certainly, if it was one long movie, you could maybe edit these two into one movie right. because have- they're so similar in tone and structure and look, especially look. Yeah. Uh, the actors are all different roles. That's the only thing that might confuse people. Well, they go out to the desert, assume different identities. Boom. There you go. And- <laughs> I just fixed your plot hole, Marty. Um, but, you know, it's 
I think I think the acting's a little bit over the top in some in in some ways in <laughs> Casino. The James Wood character, James Woods character, and the Sharon Stone character. I think that's what yeah. I think they delivered in their ten out of ten. I just think they're that they're it's a little over the top. I like a little more subtlety in the in the Goodfellas. And you can kind of compare these two movies. The, the settings are different, but they're about kind of the same thing. Right. It's the same type of. To me, they're like the Godfather is Goodfellows and Godfather 2 is Casino. And I've always liked Godfather better. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I do like the between Godfather 1 and 2. I, there is no Godfather uh, 1. Godfather and Godfather Part 2. And it's two. the Godfather. The Godfather and the Godfather Part 2. I like the Shook. Godfather um, better than the second one. Like and you've never there. seen Kundu. <laughs> I I know I wanted to because it's just that fucking line and Sopranos party Kundu. And uh, on my list of of Scorsese movies that I knew you weren't going to watch in in uh, preparation of this podcast, I knew it was going to be the Agent uh, the Age of Innocence <laughs> and Kundu for sure, for sure. Those were those were your bets. Those were your uh, your uh, ace bet. What was his, what's his name? Ace. And- you wouldn't watch Kundu if it was the only movie you had on VHS on a desert island. What do you think I'd watch? Watch first, Age of Innocence or Kundun? If you had both? Yeah, if I you pick one. I had to pick one. Age of Innocence. I, I think I would too. That's just sad. Why? I don't know. I just Kundun actually happened. It's real. Oh, is it? Okay. You don't even know what it's fucking about? I no, I don't. I just know it's about like uh it's uh, it's about the Dalai Lama. There you go. Oh, okay. That's what oh it's about. Oh my god. I thought it was about something different. Never mind. What? Tell me what tell oh, me. I'm not even no, gonna dig be my trench. honest. I thought it was about like so, like some side of like part of uh, like Chinese civilization during that time. I don't know. What do you think this is about? What do you know about the Dalai Lama? First of all, he was a good person. Oh my! Maybe maybe God. not. I haven't seen Kundun. Eddie, <laughs> you, if you don't think He's the a, Dalai Lama has something to do with the Chinese civilization, I know he's I, the, the head of it. He was like, he was like a spiritual leader, you know. Oh, you're gonna get yourself in so much trouble. You know, I'm gonna I'm stop talking. Talk oh about my, Kundun. free Taiwan! <laughs> <laughs> you might as well be wearing a shirt. Oh my God, I'm not even gonna touch this movie now. No, I'm you had no that. idea what it was about. You just knew you'd never watch it because it was about something in Chinese civilization. No, it wasn't. I wasn't gonna watch it because of that. I remember you saying. I always remember you talking about this movie. You're like, you'll, you would never get through this. You would never get through this. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna and I love it by the way. I, I'm sh- well, okay, cool. Scorsese gets to go to a new continent that we haven't seen and film it in a way where it's his interpretation of how beautiful the continent is. Just to start with, that should pique your interest. Mm-hmm. You're not a visual guy. I know I that. Am, I am, You're I not am. a verbal guy either. What kind of guy are you? Uh, auditory and masturbatory. Got it. Yep. Oh, um, all the Tories. So he gets to go over there and turn in a movie in a different place that we've never seen him interpret. That again, that alone gets you in. That gets the ticket bought and your butt in the seat. Mm-hmm. I, I don't understand why this one is such a turnoff. The only thing I can say is, well, it didn't have bullets and guns and De Niro or any notable actors that I know, and I don't want to watch a movie about philosophy. Oh, that's what it's a philosophical movie. Okay, cool. I, it's I, about the Dalai Lama. Yeah, for sure. How do you not know it's a what? Can't touch the Dalai Lama. So let's move on to 1999's Bringing Out the Dead. Today's episode of the Four Seasons of Film podcast is brought to you by Phil's Coffee. Phil specializes in handcrafted coffee made one cup at a time. Visit a location today or find them on the web at philscoffee.com. That's Phil's with a Z, coffee.com. Find the beans you're looking for. That's the Dalai Lama. So let's move on to 1999's Bringing Out the Dead. Oh, I, this was a first time watch for me. Oh, interesting. So yeah. this is one. Um, another one, you know, after after Kundun uh, didn't make any money, I assume. I'm not even going to look at the numbers, but I'm guessing because Andy represents the audience for that movie, um, even though it's brilliant. <laughs> Scorsese goes slumming with Nicolas Cage. Slumming? No, no, no. It's just a small movie. It's a smaller movie yeah, than you would than you would think, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, um, it's an Nicholas, Nicholas Cage is an ambulance driver. Yeah, that's, that's sleep deprived, doesn't know what the hell's going on. He's and tra- so what happens? He starts hallucinating. Yeah, and so he sees these people that are dying, and the spirits of these fucking people that are, that he's you know taken to that hospital. Um, and you know he's on the edge. He's been up for what like a week straight. He just keeps working and he's just losing it, man. Okay, he's what do you like about the movie? Um, I like, the, well, definitely the, the you definitely feel the tension and like you feel like you're, he does a great job of 
bringing his, uh, like Cage's performance through the shots of you feel like you're strung out like like Cage's throughout this whole movie. That was my favorite thing about it. And you know, he's trying to be sweet to the to the hotel uh, not hotel nurse, the the <laughs> hospital nurse, the both stars of ages. Um and you know, and he's trying to do the right thing, but he's, you know, shooting up the fucking or you know, pumping himself with drugs just to keep going. I don't you know? know how you managed to bore me with with synopsis of Scorsese movies. This is just insane. Well, I could. you're so long winded, but you don't have any sense of breathing. Uh, uh, well, that that's pretty much it. I can I can I can end it there. <laughs> <laughs> Brevity. We have 23 years to get through here. We need to speed this process up. Bring out the dead. What'd you think? Great first time watch. Why? I, uh, because it was it was interesting. It was like, hey man, I felt like strung out like Nicolas Cage going through here to all these shitty situations of trying to save these people and the you know the all through the different types of you know the the bad neighborhoods that he went through. Cool. Gangs of New York, two thousand two. God, man. Whoops. This is, I fucking love this movie. Did you I, almost say whoopsie daisy? I almost said whoopsie daisy. Oh my. The uh, go, go ahead. Uh, the uh, accents in the movie don't bother you. I, I, they're trying to <laughs> score says he came out recently and kind of against this movie like say he would never work with Miramax again in this way he didn't like working with Weinstein it was too big a budget it was too big a responsibility and too many too many chefs in the kitchen okay um, yeah, that makes sense. and he still turns in this movie and it's still starring Daniel Day Lewis and if you cut everybody out of the movie except for Daniel Day Lewis's scenes I would still watch this movie. Oh, fuck yeah, man. He, Bill the Butcher, man. Fucking amazing performance. It's iconic. It's like yeah. it's iconic up there with Abraham Lincoln. For sure. I mean, it's like this guy really existed. I have no idea if he did really exist or if it's based off somebody that did exist. Um, but I love the history of New York City, and I want to read the book that this is based on, and it's because of Daniel Day-Lewis that I want to go deeper into this story. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was just when DiCaprio was getting uh, uh, warmed up with accents, I should say. <laughs> so, so you know, it is some scenes are a little all over the place. You know, they don't match to other scenes. And I was noticing that in 2002 when I was a, a young pup watching movies. Uh, it's hard to do fucking accents. Oh, for sure. Okay. And an Irish accent, yeah. too, is very hard, especially. I don't know why Americans can't do other people's accents, but they can all do ours. Right. It's we sound the like weirdest idiots. fucking thing. We sound like idiots. That's I, we talk a, lo a lot slower, I guess. I don't time. talk slow. You just can't understand me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to you. Oh, well. Um, visually, the movie's incredible. Visually, for the time frame. Uh, the, the epic scale of the Gangs of New York, it's uh, it's always a great watch. There's just issues with the accents. And I, I don't know why. I'm always such a stickler for accents. I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm a prick. Yeah, no, I, 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 I get it, man. But it's just, If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. I But I give people, like with this, it's hard, man. I'll give them, give them all a pass. Well, you get all passes from Andy. That means a lot. I mean, that literally means that they can do anything and you know, just agree with them. You are a fucking agent. That's right. Nah, 15%. 2004 is the Aviator. The Aviator. I've only seen this, I think, twice. Totally. I think it's a more. I think it's a Martin Scorsese masterpiece. Actually, I, I loved it, man. Howard Hawks. It any movie that is set in the golden age of Hollywood and is represented this well is my favorite movie. And this, to me, it's the best DiCaprio is. It's the best Scorsese gets in the 2000s. Everything about this movie makes me want to watch it again when I bring it up. It is so, it's a beautiful love letter to cinema as much as it is a love letter to aviation. I actually think it's a bigger love letter to cinema than it is aviation. And it's called The Fucking Aviator. Yeah, yeah. I watch it for the Hollywood stuff. I don't watch it for the aviation stuff. Right, yeah. I, yeah but it's just it's just such a beautiful, like this, he always, he does a great job of creating a world, but I always remember the, the couple times I've seen this, it's just, it's just, it's just so amazing, the uh, picture he painted with everything. You're just jealous you're not pissing in jars. <laughs> I know you. He didn't have to get up. <laughs> and he's naked. <laughs> um, like a lot of movies on this list, you know, what can you really say about 2006's The Departed? Oh, my God. Uh, I th this, this is, uh, fucking I love this movie. But no, <laughs> but what? I don't have. A... It's fucked up. It's based on a Chinese uh, trilogy of films called Infernal Affairs. Oh, um, and from what I hear, it's pretty much a remake of those, but all in one movie. Okay. So 
you having not known that baffles my mind because you love The Departed. I know how much you love The Departed. And it doesn't baffle my mind because you do absolutely no research into the things you like. You just keep eating chocolate cake. Yeah, man. I don't really care where it comes from. Hey, hey, that's not... I mean, okay. That yes, is it is true. true. That is true. I can't argue that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I figure... I guess that's what makes a film fan and a, uh, a film lover like myself is... I can't stand it. If I love it, I have to know why, how it was made, where it was come from. I, I need to know everything about the film. And you just watch it with your Los Ojos and everything's everything's done. <laughs> my my Los Ojos. <laughs> <laughs> Multicultural now, huh? Um, yeah, no, I, because I, I love the magic cinema. I, and I can. You're saying exactly what I'm not saying. I can turn my brain off to like, let me just enjoy this this picture, this From, film. Everything about The Departed is fucking unbelievable. I think yeah, the yeah. cast, most of all. Oh, for sure. The amount of talent that you've got. You got Leo. You got Damon. You got Nicholson. You got Wahlberg. You got Martin Sheen. I mean, Ray Winstone's a fucking beast. Oh my god! Yeah, Dara Farminga. Frenchy. Anthony Anderson's amazing in this. How yeah. does that happen? And I love and I love Alec Baldwin's character. He's Alec a little Baldwin's over top, amazing. A little, a little over the top, but he, he's a good ball busting sergeant. There's a lot of people that are over the top. Martin in this. Sheen. There's a. I think actually Anthony Anderson could win an Oscar someday. He was, yeah. He for as little a role as he had, coming from being a comedian, a guy I would recognize from like Harold Kumar, right? <laughs> he does <laughs> this, and you go, he's, he's an FBI agent. Get the fuck out of here! Yeah. And he's pivotal to the story. Yeah, especially at the end when he has to question his his ethics and what he's gonna do. I mean, it's it's one of the best crime movies of all time. There's a rat everywhere. I mean, the only thing that people give this shit. Move, about the fucking shit. rat at the it's, end. Yeah, the, and I, even from the first viewing, I never thought that was over the top. I didn't think anything of it besides like, that is the metaphor, uh, there it symbolism. is. Symbolism. I can't believe people give this movie shit over that. That's what they're hung up on. I don't get that. Like, fucking who cares? He, he was a fucking rat, man. He was a rat. Not Jack Nicholson's dildo. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> and that's, that always makes me laugh. I mean, it makes you laugh, but that's ridiculous. It is. That, yeah, I'm gonna. we'll start a campaign to CGI out the dildo. I can't remember uh, the last movie that Nicholson died in, let alone was shot in the fucking head. Yeah. I mean, it, it takes a lot for a, a movie star to die in a movie, but also die ugly. Right. And yeah. that just shows you how fucking badass Jack Nicholson is. God, I love oh, him. And that scene when he's like uh, miming or behind DiCaprio when Frenchie's talking to him and he's like... You know, like he's like he's thinking like, oh, he's he's the one that's the rat. Like I always that always just is so creepy and just so like, oh, fuck, man. I remember the first time watching just be like, oh, my God, he's about to get about to get plugged, clipped, whatever. whatever. 2010's Shutter Island. Shut, you. Oh, my God. This movie, this movie is, I still, has an asterisk next to it because I still think I still watch this and pick up new things from this movie. Oh, it's, I it's love a, this movie. It's the first Scorsese movie where you can watch it a million times and still try to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Because it's so multi-layered on what you think happened versus what you walk away thinking happened. Mm -hmm. And I even the ending of the movie, which after somebody, the fifth which or somebody <laughs> almost ruined okay, for me. Tell the tell the tell the story. Uh so I, I believe uh you saw Shutter Island when we were hanging out. With some um, that's there. correct. I did see Shutter Island. And why like, would I be here if I didn't see it? Like I, I guess you, you were coming out. Like I was watch. I was starting to watch it, and you, you walk in and say, "Oh, he's a ghost the whole time." <laughs> that's the end. And walk away. And I'm like, I'm just. I haven't seen this before. I've heard great things. I want to watch it. And then fucking, I didn't watch it for years. But is that's not true? It's not true at all. But I thought I was like, why am I getting? Because that's like a who done it, like mystery thriller, like not who done it, but like what's going on, you know? You didn't think how could this guy be a ghost when everyone's talking to him? Well, I just I was like a half hour in. I'm like, what the fuck? Man? What do you think is the sixth sense? I didn't know. I, I I turned off the movie and I didn't pick it up for years. And then I finally was like, wait a minute, he doesn't die. And then you liked it. I did. <laughs> and then I I've seen it many times since then. But my first, I'll never forget that first watch of it. Um, I love the movie. I think it's amazing. 
I think it is a little bit much when you think about the the elaborate scheme. Right, we were gonna you're gonna placate this guy. The elaborate scheme that you would have to undertake to placate this mental patient. Right. I mean, it is a little unbelievable, but at the same time, it's so serious, it's believable. But it's like they they've done it a bunch of times. It's not like <laughs> hey, let's just, let's just do it once in an experiment. Like okay, I get that, but they keep doing it. Oh, we keep doing this every time, and you yeah. go, aren't these people getting kind of sick of this? And Mark, I love Mark Ruffalo. I think that's why they too. lobotomize him at the end, even the. the the ending he where he like fakes it so they lobotomize him. Yeah. I actually think they were gonna do it anyway because they're just tired. Of, they're tired of doing this, yeah, this they conceit, they, this setup. They're they're tired of the same play being played. Like, like guys, I don't want to play. I'm a doctor. I don't want to play doctor anymore. I just want to get on with other patients. Right, help people, <laughs> not not Daniels. And it also is one of my my. It's gonna be an elaborate prank sometime to fuck your world up by surrounding you with actors who try to make you feel like you aren't the person that you think you are. Well, right. I, 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 you know, at the, on the other side of that, I would, I would have a good time. And like, what damn ma- it, you pulled it off. What makes you think I'm not doing it right now? And I haven't been for the past 25 years. Well, I feel like a charlatan. I, I don't what, know who what's I am. What's a charlatan? Sh- I, I, <laughs> Is that like the Carlton dance? Yeah, but you're charlatan? A char- <laughs> charlatan. Do you know the right charlatan. term? A charlatan. Charlatan? Yeah. Is that I, what we're saying? Yeah, but not I, somebody from Charlotte. No, not, so, not, not somebody from Charlotte. Anyway, can't a person make a goddamn mistake every once in a while? Fucking, no. Fucking not vultures. You, vultures in this fucking studio. Not when you say it with such gusto. Anyway, moving on. What's next? Uh, Hugo, 2011. Uh, I've only seen this once. I know you love this And movie. this is, this, and just the way you're saying that from 2011, Hugo, um, just the way you said that sentence to me, this is another one I'd put at the bottom of your Scorsese list. Just at the <laughs> bottom. You're like, what the fuck is this children's movie? This I, thing. What, I don't give a shit about anybody's parents and like Jude Law. And, and, and just, that's Borat. <laughs> Fucking, I've, seen, I, I've seen it. I get it. It's, it's, great, it's, it's a great film. Okay, could you talk about how you really feel about the film? Because you're just, I don't even you're talk just about bullshitting me. I just, I've only seen it once. I, re- I don't remember really what, what it was about. It's I, set in my favorite city in 1931 in Paris. Yeah. Uh, it's about an orphan living in the walls of a train station, and he gets wrapped up in a mystery involving his late father. And uh, it's, a, it's another love letter, love letter to cinema because the grandfather is George Milliers. Ah. And that is uh, uh, auteur. <laughs> <laughs> he was a silent film genius. Yeah, of an that innovator. Guy. Yeah, of course. Millier. <sighs> he did. You have to have. Okay, the only way I can really is you, you know the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> oh, the moon thing. <laughs> yes, it's called a, a trip to the moon. Um, and the moon famously gets a rocket in the eye. Right, yeah. That's that I've was seen, stolen from him. I've seen I've seen the the original. I've I've seen Why? his work. Why have you seen that? Because I remember this is what this is based out of. No, but yeah, we've just established you don't do your homework. So how have you? Not seen all this? the time. So you've seen the Smashing Pumpkins video for tonight. Tonight, I have seen that. Yeah, that's where you got your memory of. I have seen the full film. Um, it is a it's a it's a children's movie, but it Hugo means so much to me. I saw it in 3D. I saw it in the theater. It's it's one of my favorite holiday movies. It takes you back to childhood the acting's great um it it is a little tongue-in-cheek in the best way and it just delivers a secret kiss of this is also about uh silent film and how genius film was when we didn't have to rely on dialogue you had to make up entertainment in other ways and the most innovative ways were done by george Milliers. oh my god watch his watch his work uh, watch Hugo to start, and then you'll you'll have an appreciation for it. Or unless it goes totally over your head like Andy. Yes, exactly. I, I got to watch it again. I've only seen it once. Maybe I'll get it all this time. I am moving on. Um, oh, and this one goes right back at the top of the list. After 2011, of course, Andy's favorite, favorite film by Scorsese, The Wolf of Wall Street. I, I, I do like this film. The total opposite... <laughs> Of Hugo. Yes. Total opposite. This one, I know why you like this. It's about excess and boobs. That's not all. Oh, that oh, is what wild. you like about it. I don't want to hear it. That's what you like about it. This I don't give a this sh- movie. Here's the thing. I don't care about that. Like after 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 college, like the boobs thing, that went away for me. Like if it had boobs, great. If it didn't have How boobs, many boobs did you see in college? I mean it's not, not not live, but I've seen a lot of a lot of horror films with a lot of boobs. I mean, you're speaking up. pretty highly of yourself to think you that college ruined boobs for you. No, it wasn't college ruining boobs. It was just like, okay, cool. 
you but know. something ruined boobs. <laughs> <laughs> nothing ruined boobs. I love boobs. You're on the couch. We need to talk. No, I love boobs. I have nothing, nothing against boobs. Well, you I are a boob, so yeah, that works exactly. So, but it's it's the it's the excess and it's the um, it's the see. I don't like the excess. I think it celebrates the excess too much, and I I think it actually gets misinterpreted. And people walk away going, that guy was cool. No, he was a fucking scumbag. I think the entire culture that the film births is should be something to be condemned instead of celebrated as a, a reward or a want to be, as a lifestyle. And instead, people walk away from it and go, that's my favorite because, oh my God, I wish I was all of them. Or I wish I worked there. Or I wish I had that much money. Or I wish it, it's just... It, it feels like somebody's saying like a really bad, a, a joke that's out of, that's in poor taste and people go and repeat it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. I I and if you take away you and your fandom of The Wolf of Wall Street, then I like it. Okay. Gotcha. Your brand of dude ruins this movie. See, but I and I, you know, and it also seems like more of a DiCaprio movie than a Scorsese movie. It's for sure. It was I, the I, first one of those, and and I love Jonah Hill's performance. And for me, that he, I like it better than uh, 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 I almost said DiCap DiCaprio, uh, DiCaprio's performance in in the movie. I just love his performance. It is just fucking nuts. He's just nuts. And um, oh, what's the uh, what's his name? He was on uh, John Bernthal. I love his character too. I think it's. A, I still think it's. There's genius to it and. And I, I, I have seen it a number of times, maybe five, six, seven, eight times. It does. It just when I watch it, I can't watch it as just a fan of the movie. I watch it and go, "Oh, this one probably had a negative society or negative impact on society because of what people are celebrating about this." Oh, okay, I can see that. Well, I grew up with a bunch of bros around me, mm. uh, and wannabe bros also still around me. Wannabe. Um. So <laughs> we're we're into the teens. Nice. We're into the teens now, and we're gonna we're gonna bypass some. Uh, Lesser known projects and go to Scorsese's passion project of all time, the one he wanted to make for years before he finally got to make it, 2016's Silence. First time watch for me. Wow. I, 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 it was a first time watch, yeah. I will I've, admit, I've always wanted to come back and watch it, yeah. I will admit I've only seen this twice. Okay. Because this might be like the heaviest Scorsese movie I think I've ever right. seen. It's, it's, it's so, I think it's so much more deeply religious than the passion or, or than uh, the last temptation of Christ. Yeah. That, cause, cause the last temptation, it's still like the, the story of Jesus and all that. But yeah, this like is, it could this, be a fantasy. Right. But this is like, these people were tortured, tortured and they were, you know, they're, and they're like, Hey, if we convert to Christianity, we're going to, you know, it's spreading throughout Japan, you know, well, the forced torture and conversion of, of Jesuit priests, too. It wasn't yeah. just the people of Japan. I mean, okay, so the, the, the story set in the 17th century. It's about Jesuit priests that go to Japan to to save their mentor, uh, played by Liam Neeson, yep. and figure out what happened to him because he disappeared. And so when you go, you see life in 17th century Japan where there are Christians and there are people that uh, from the government or from society that are rounding up Christians and killing them unless they pronounce that they are not Christians. Yeah. And it is torturous because it's it's literally it seems it's it's the most simple movie in the world when it comes to choice, but having somebody go die or step on step. this this Bible is it what they stepped it, no, on. No, it's like a, sp a specific stone. You know, it was like a it was like, like a, a Christianity stone symbol, or something. Yeah, it's like step on this stone with your bare foot or you're gonna die. And people. Just like they would now. They're so into their own beliefs, they couldn't do it, so they died. And they're sacrificing themselves for their own beliefs. So just the power of that statement, what, no matter what your belief is, the whole movie is riddled with this insane choice. And, oh my God, you... Yeah, it's it's the, it's one of the heaviest movies. I think it's the heaviest movie Scorsese ever did. Yeah. It is it's, such it's, a, it's a... It's a bullwhip. God. Yeah, I, I was I was taken aback, but I was like, oh fuck, man, this is this is depressing, <laughs> you know. And they and they're you know in the moments where they're all huddled together and they're still holding on to their faith, like that's the only thing getting them through being detained. And you know they're seeking out these priests, going through jungles just to find it, you know, just like the lengths that people would go, man. Well, it gave us uh, Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver together as a perfect uh, team. I think yeah. they're both amazing actors, and seeing them together. In the film, it's it's one of my favorite things. I love Liam Neeson in this film because he, I, 
this one is I, a lot of people haven't seen it, so I'm not going to spoil this movie. Liam, but Liam Neeson's performance is one of my favorite of his of all time. Yeah, because I mean, it's just so unexpected. Yeah, you never. It, I mean, you never think this movie goes where it does go. It's a hell of a watch. Be ready to watch this one with like a deep breath every 15 minutes. Yeah. It is uh, intense. Whew. Not and not in the way you think it's not in be. a good fellas no. intense way. This is a this is a an intense reality movie. Humanity <laughs> at the time, the 17th century. And then we get to the Irishman in 2019. Oh, what can you say about this movie? I fucking love this. Critics movie. say <laughs> Critics say they, 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 I disagree with all the critics. I think this is a masterpiece. Yeah. I think it's um it this is if if Scorsese if Scorsese says he's worried about retirement or getting older not not making movies anymore I if he ends his career I would say this is the start of the late stage Scorsese films mm-hmm. right here this is this is when the he turning the corner of, he made you know. another epic in the vein of Goodfellas Casino this could be the the uh, like the the trilogy for sure yeah it was long it was gorgeous I wanted more of it I don't give a fuck if it was three hours and thirty I, me, minutes I want four hours I, I want five too. hours I want to read too. the book it was amazing and you know what for all those people that say it was slow it's you it's not the film yeah there's something wrong with you where you can't sit in a martin scorsese picture in silence and and without dialogue and live with these characters and this action there's something wrong with you you could hear a pin drop in the theater i saw this in because we were mesmerized going he has total command over us as an audience he could do anything right now the last sequence of the film where Do- where De Niro has to get on the plane to go meet oh, Jimmy yeah. Hoffa, it's com- it's almost without dialogue. Yeah. It's so quiet. It's so heavy because you, you don't want it to happen, but you know it's going to happen. It breaks your fucking heart in two. Yeah. It is, it's a tragedy. This is Shakespeare. It's one of his best movies of all time. The Irishman rules. Yes. I, I I will defend this movie to the death. People I, 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 again, people that can't take it for its length or how slow it was or anything. You know what? I have I have no sympathy for you. I don't know what you're expecting out of out of out of this artist, but anything you this is what I realize. Anything you get out of Scorsese, you better celebrate. Mm-hmm. He knows what he's doing and he's given and he gives no fucks anymore. Right. He's just going to turn it in and it's going to be great. And the Irishman, I don't know what people missed. It's a 10 out of 10 out of 10 out of 10. That's a 15. It's too good. I want to watch it every time it's fucking on. Oh, yeah. I did that. Me too. Ah. We've made it. We've made it to the to the newest one. Wow. I can't believe we're actually talking about it. How much, how many, how much time has, have we done? Uh, probably like 55 minutes. Oh, that's not bad. Maybe, okay. Maybe wow. I don't even uh, feel like I have to use a restroom. <laughs> Well, it's it's been a long journey, man. We went throughout his went through his whole career. I sped it up a little bit here and there. Yeah, well, we got to. This is the new, the newer movies. Everyone's I feel like they've seen him a lot more. Maybe not maybe not as much of his earlier cuts. You know? Nobody's seen Silence apparently. I I I didn't up until a few weeks ago. Well, it's because you're not a real Scorsese fan. You're just a Goodfellas Scorsese fan. Sorry, at Casino. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, no, no, that, that's no, a, I mean, that's I, a, no, no, no correct, that's a negative thing. No, by correct the way. It, correcting between the not two, that the movie. I know I'm not proud of it, but I hey, I've I I have I watched like seven new Scorsese films. Not that there's anything wrong with Goodfellas or Casino, but there you have to differentiate. There are Scorsese fans, and then there are the, the mafia fans. Right. Yeah. And you are one of them. Not you're now. not a cinema fan. I am. A you cinema are. Fan. You're a mafia Scorsese fan. I'm both. No. T- before we get in the last one, tell me your top five. Scorsese films. All right, let's get into the movie. Uh, well, it's because uh, okay, um, you don't you don't have a list in front of you. This is why this is the best. Yeah, well, now uh, definitely, Last Temptation of Christ is in the top. Of course, Casino's number no, no. One. I want one through five, starting with number five. Number five. Well, let me do it the other way. Casino is number one. That makes no sense. Then Goodfellas. That makes no is sense. Is number two. Number three is The Irishman. Number four is Departed, and then number five is The Last Temptation of Christ. Okay. There, I understand. There's no I, convincing ignorance here. You, you I know. I you, just you're putting them out. Casino as the best film he's ever done, only because it's the one you've seen the most, and it was the first one you saw. That's not what I'm asking, and so your list is null and void. Anyway, I love. I, I love all the. No, d- my d- top five. Dismiss me all you want. That's what ignorance does. Speaking truth to ignorance. It's not the ignorance would just go. Ah, just just go on with your fancy rhetoric and your fancy. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's your exactly. fancy microphone. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. 
Keep telling, keep spinning your yawn. 2023's Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah. Did you see this? I did, but I had a little mishap in my movie, so. Oh, it was you watching. That was the mishap? <laughs> no, it wasn't. You were, you were awake. I was awake the whole time, and then the, the sound cut out in the, in the last 15 minutes, 10 minutes of the last 15 minutes. I just finished the book. Oh, wow. I was so taken with the movie that I had to read the book that it was based on because I wanted to know more. Yeah. It's based on the Osage murders um, in the early 20th century. And that's where that's where I knew we were going, but I had no idea what really happened. Right. He blew the, it, for me, blew the doors wide open on that. I was like, damn, this is, this well, is some crazy, heinous shit. Of course it is. I mean, the... <laughs> The idea of the movie, you know, you go, oh God, the history of Native Americans in this country, you're tackling that. And then you go, oh, no, it's about, it's specifically about murders. Mm -hmm. And that have not known too much about the actual murders. You start to clench when the movie starts because apparently the Osage had an affluent society yeah. because they discovered oil on their own land. They got a great amount of money for that oil. And then it, what happens always, the white man comes in and just slowly and, and even occasionally abruptly mm -hmm. steals it all away and says, Nope, that's, that's ours. Right. And how that unfolds in a three and a half hour movie is torturous because <laughs> you watch just the murder and the rape of the land and of the rape of a society and of a people and it's so hard to watch because it's true right yeah you just want to hang your head in shame but you're also watching it because it's so important to watch and to understand that it is true you feel like you need to come out of this movie and tell everybody about it that doesn't know right and that doesn't even help no, no. None of it helps. And I can understand why people uh, people didn't like the movie because of that. I can understand why Native people also didn't like the movie. It's such, it's too complicated. It's too complicated to say anything besides, oh my God, this, this movie blew my fucking hair back because number one, it's a Scorsese movie and he knows how to excellently tell a story, but it tells it, he tells it so real. It's the most, destructively heartbreaking movie of the year, I think. Even more than Oppenheimer. Yeah. And that one ends with the creation of a nuclear bomb. Right. An atomic bomb, sorry. <laughs> this one is the systematic destruction of a people that were once affluent in modern society. Right. Not, not just not just the, you know, uh, Columbus society where we, you know, they came and they said they discovered this land. These people were literally living high on the hog and they just were devastated by like like its own mafia. Yeah, the, the the everyone coming in and just regulating them, taking away their rights, taking away their lives, but taking away their money, just the just deplorable things. I guess the spoilers are abound, but um, what's well, history? The so problem. Just... See, there's no problem with it, but the 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 movie is so brilliant because I don't think I I can't think of a movie that's similar where you know who the villain is the first time you see him and you are just waiting for the big reveal that he is the villain and that doesn't happen. Yeah. It's literally just... And suddenly it's just common knowledge that he's the villain and you suspected him all the time and it's so matter of fact, hey, did you kill these people? Yeah, I did. And you go, oh yeah, I knew it. Yeah. I knew sure. it. Yeah. And you go, what the fuck? It's not, a, it's not a bigger deal because your suspicions will always be right in this movie. Yeah. You could, you, yeah. <laughs> I forgot you could tell from a mile away where you're like, oh shit. And that. when it finally does hit you, you go, yeah, I knew. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. I, yeah, this, wow. I never seen a movie that does it so subtly, the reveal of the true villain because the audience knows who the true villain is all the time. Yeah. <laughs> we know he's going to hatch up a plan so that way he can take all the money and all the land. Lily fucking Gladstone needs to win a goddamn Oscar for this, though. Oh, she man. was so good in this. It was so understated in the beginning and then tragic and just oh, gut-wrenching by the end. She, I, I haven't seen a better performance I missed this the, year. Her speech at the end, that was when the fucking shit cut out. I was so pissed when he, her and Leo were talking one-on-one -on -one after the trial. Wow. That, okay. That's when, I. so I don't know what was said. I have to watch it. Did you get to the radio part? 
Yeah, when they're doing. Yes, I did. Do, to, the, to the sound end. was in that. The sound was in that. It came back on after <laughs> right be- right before that. So that I was like, okay, I I know how it ended, but like to hear the performance, to feel the emotion, and you're like, oh well. Uh, no spoilers because people do it. But what happens between the two of them, you can figure out what what happened, but the how it happened. You you know what I'm saying? From no, because I heard the speech and you're totally off. Okay, well, I didn't hear the <laughs> fucking speech. What do you want me to do? So you can't tell what's going on in the silent film. I can. I can tell. He's, she's like... I, I think she's apologizing for Leo. To no, Leo she's about, not apologizing. About all the things that he did to her. No, no. I know she's... She's making her the smarter decision, and and I forgive you. No, she didn't. No, I know that. <laughs> She's like, I'm walking away. I'll cut that out. Well, maybe if you would have studied the George Villiers Hugo movie a little bit more about silent oh, film, fuck yourself. you might yeah. have uh, you might have read the situation in context more. Well, also too, I was I, I was walking to get up to go tell him because no one was like for like thirty seconds, no one was getting up. I was like, oh shit. Maybe maybe and that's then, the way the movie was supposed to go, and you. I'm just not saying that that you are right or wrong. No, I saw the lights go out in the theater. Someone cut the fucking switch to the speakers because yeah. it was it was like eleven thirty at night, and I'm like, no, we're the fucking everyone was like, no. That was the fucking memo that Scorsese sent to every theater. No, you're so full of shit. You're not doing this changing my... It my, my... happened every screening. I'm telling you, that's the big reveal of the podcast. Spoiler alert. No fucking way. Yeah, look it up. No way. Yeah. Memo to self to every theater. He did that on purpose. That was part of the magic of the movie. Get, no way. Yes, I am bullshitting. I can't believe you're looking that up. Well, you really? How thick are you? Well, you know what? I didn't know. I was just, I had to do my due diligence for the people. Gullible, unbelievable. I'm just tired of arguing with you. Fuck it. What, what, you're tired what? of truth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, fuck, man. So I got I to gotta see the last 10 minutes. Oh, last um, 10 minutes. It's, it. a, it's a brilliant film. It's what it's top five of the year for me. It, it's, it's hard to digest because like the Irishman was the, the one before this. I've probably seen that 10 times. I'm going to watch this one 10 times. DiCaprio is amazing in this yeah. movie. He's fucking amazing. His teeth are amazing and his accent's amazing. Yeah. He's nailing the accents, folks. We've he, come full circle. Okay, he's, yeah, he's 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 uh getting better. And the return of a De Niro that f- is unbelievable. Oh, I know. Unbe- this is not Meet the Fockers, Andy. Sorry. I oh well I, this is I, this a is a De Niro, Niro for the ages again. Yeah. This is a Scorsese movie for the ages again. Marty, please keep making movies. For God's sake. Oh my God, I, I can't even imagine a world where there isn't a new Scorsese movie to look forward to because you always go in and you go, oh, is it going to be as great as all his other ones? Oh, I hope so. There's no doubt anymore. He right. does, He's never made a bad movie. No. He's I, never made a bad that's movie. that's what I've learned through my journey. Of- yeah, well, you haven't seen them all. Well, I assume. You assumed he made two bad movies. No, not that we're bad. Age of Innocence. No, and I Dune didn't. Dune. It wasn't because it was bad. It was because. And it, the only reason that you uh, you're not saying is because you're trying to save face. You also think Hugo is a bad movie. I don't think it's a bad movie. Those are just your bottom three. No, this... people have bottom threes. You got a bottom three. I got a bottom. Let's three. just admit it. Yeah, I do. That's just sad. What? That's just sad. Three have to be at the bottom. You can't. Well, I'm sorry. Bringing out the dead's at the bottom for me. That one's maybe number four it's, off from the just bottom. So sad. No, you're just no, so sad. No, 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 maybe. I don't know. I have, uh, to, I have to go back and rank them now. Yeah, please. No, you would you would watch Bringing Out the Dead before you'd watch Who's That Knocking Again. That's for sure. Yeah, don't even bullshit yeah, me. I'm not going to argue that. Think, yeah, that's, that's true. A, that's I true. know you better than you. You don't even need to be here. Well, I can just answer for you. All right, well, My yeah. name's Andrew Pesson. I don't like art. Fuck you. That's not true. I love art. Anything I am an that doesn't have bullets in it bores me. That's not true. I love... Uh, film history, kiss my ass. I know some film history. Children, ugh. Okay, yeah. The Dalai Lama? Who's that? <laughs> no. Is his first name Dolly? <laughs> like Dolly Parton? Um, go see Killers of Flower Moon. It's one of the best movies of the year. There's not a much... I don't want to spoil it. Uh, there's not much more to elaborate on it, but it's tragic. It's compl- it's unbelievably well done, and it's another epic by a man that I think we clearly have covered i have clearly covered has not ever made a bad movie um and the other one of us uh-huh uh, you could fill in the blank there the other one of us went through a magical journey of filling in the gaps and going back to an uh an absolute force and it's, it's just like this wrap-up it's completely bullshit <laughs> and just one of the greatest filmmakers of all time getting to know him a little bit more intimately and my love for him just keeps continuing to grow Except for Kundun, Age of Innocence, and Hugo. Don't put Hugo in there, man. I, I don't. I, I, 
I like I, I don't have anything against fucking Hugo. <laughs> like I don't I don't understand how this became a thing. Like I feel like I was like fuck this movie. No, I was like oh that was cool. If I put it on tonight, you'd be like come on man, I want you know something what? else. Let's watch it tonight. Let's fucking do it. All right, put it on Hugo tonight. It's a Christmas movie, right? And as soon as you fall asleep, I'm going to take pictures. <laughs> I'm going to time code the pictures and it's going to be all over the fucking internet. <laughs> at, at one hour and two minutes and 37 seconds, Andy fell asleep. And you know what? Hugo's, Hugo is actually a ghost. He's been dead the whole time. Oh, thank you. I figured. Uh, keep film alive, my friends. Thank you for existing, uh, Mr. Martin Scorsese. We love you. We love your films. And if we ever meet you at a party, I'm going to embarrass the shit out of Andy with his three least favorite movies <laughs> of yours. <laughs> I will. Uh, I would love that. All right, keep them alive. Bye.